So now we have gotten last week through verse 4. And as you know, I always do a one verse overlap anyway. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And we talked about last week, and, and this is something that uh, honestly I didn't even come to understand until uh, some years back, but talking about the difference between scriptures and the New Testament. And how important it is to understand. You know, uh, Paul is saying here, the things were written afore time. So he's saying things that were written before now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this passage is not speaking of Matthew through Revelation. Right. It is talking about the Old Testament, what the Jewish people call Torah. That is what he is referring to any time you see the word scriptures in the Bible, it is referring to the Torah, to the Old Testament, what we call today the Old Testament. But the Old Testament, having been fulfilled in Christ Jesus, it does not mean that it no longer has any value for us today. So Paul is saying to the New Testament church, he's saying to uh, the church at Rome that consists of both Jews and Gentiles, remember that, mm -hmm. he is saying to them, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. He said there is still value in this because you may have the Gentile Christians at Rome who are saying, well, the Old Testament doesn't have any value for us. But then you've got the Old Testament believing Jews who are saying, oh, but we still have to embrace the law. So Paul's having to put it in the proper context mm -hmm. for both of them. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, the things which are written aforetime were written for our learning. This is why I say the Word of God said that the Old Testament contains types and shadows. It's, there are examples. There are patterns in the Old Testament. Uh, I've said so many times that when you look at the modern day church, you see Israel. Mm -hmm. You see that the church has literally walked in the footsteps of its older sister Israel. Mm -hmm. And they have, Israel uh, took the law and became legalistic. Mm -hmm. Instead of growing in hope for the Savior, which is what they should have done. Mm -hmm. See, if they had approached the law of Moses properly, they'd have been ready and ripe as a peach when Jesus came. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yes. But they weren't. Mm -hmm. Because they had become so bogged down in the legalism of it that when Messiah appeared, they looked right past him. Because he didn't fall into their legalisms. No, this guy's too liberal. He, you know, he does things different than it, the way we understand everything to be that He teaches that God looks on the heart. And that it's not all about the action. However, in Judaism, we believe that law refers only to actions. So they're looking at the Messiah and saying, this guy can't be the guy because he's approaching everything all wrong. No, he wasn't approaching everything all wrong. He was the author, honey. Mm -hmm. He knew what he meant when he wrote it. Mm -hmm. He wasn't all wrong. You were all wrong. Well, I got news for you. The Word of God says that when Jesus comes, he's coming for those that love his appearing. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people in the church today that are so bogged down in the legalisms of what they consider to be Christianity that they no longer, brother, are ripe for the picking. They no longer are looking for the coming of the Lord. They're no longer, their hope is no longer in the resurrection and the rapture. Their hope is in their own personal holiness or their own ability to live a certain lifestyle that they perceive as being sin free. Uh -huh. And they have put all their hope and confidence in their own ability to live holy and live godly. 
<coughs> when those of us that understand this truth correctly understand it's not about us, it's about Him. So we look forward to His coming because then we know we shall be changed. Hallelujah. For we shall see Him as He is. So Paul said, the things which were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have what? Hope. Hope. Oh. Hope. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now let's move on to verse 5. I don't want to, don't want to re preach an old sermon. Verse 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the God of patience and consolation. Wow, what a personification of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Patient and consoling. How many of us honestly hear God preached as patient uh -huh. and consoling? Amen. <laughs> Rather than judgmental and nasty and critical and just waiting to level judgment on everybody. But Paul does not, he does not represent God in that fashion. He said the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. So he's saying... It, it's his prayer, Paul's prayer, Paul's desire that our patient, consoling God would cause us to be like-minded. What does that mean? That we would be patient and consoling one with another. Mm -hmm. You hear me now? Yep. He said that you might be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus or according to the example of Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. So Paul says, this is how God would have us to conduct ourselves one toward another. Now, we, we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, Paul has been talking about how believers ought to interact with one another, how we ought to behave. Yeah. And so Paul is summing it up here by saying, basically it can be summed up in two things. Patience and consolation. Uh -huh. We talked about having a ministry of reconciliation. That is consolation. Mm -hmm. Amen. When there's a rift, you don't break it even wider open. No, you console. You try to bring it together. You try to bring healing. You try to soothe. You try to salve. So Paul is saying, according to the example of Christ Jesus, it's his desire, his prayer, that we would be like-minded one toward another in patience and consolation. Amen. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to point something out to you here. This is an example of where in the Greek, the word kai, K-A-I, is translated as even. Mm -hmm. This word right here in the original Greek can be translated as and, or it can be translated as even. And there are many times in the Word of God when you will see it said, for instance, this could potentially say that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God in the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever seen any passages where it refers to God and the Father? Uh, yeah. Now that would, anybody who's going to get nitpicky about language is going to assume that's speaking of two different people. Because when you use that conjunction and, then it implies this plus that. Mm -hmm. However, in the original Greek, that word is also correctly translated even. 
So really, in terms of translating it correctly, it has as much to do with context as it does anything. Well, now here's the problem. You've got people that don't understand this, and they read things, and they don't understand that, that uh, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There are passages that will say, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And they say, see, there's two separate. There's two different. No, there is not. God the Father, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You see, if you were to use even in that same exact passage, all of a sudden it reads entirely differently. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is, the same identical word, the only way the translators know which way to go is context. Mm -hmm. Well, now here's the problem. If you're interpreting with a Trinitarian bias, mm -hmm. then you interpret it and mm -hmm. where you think and fits. Mm -hmm. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yep. All right. So it's just important to understand these little things because, you know, the Word of God said it's the little, little fly in the ointment that can mess things up, okay? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's these little tiny things. But this is why the Word of God said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. If you read that and you use this other, it would say in the name of the Father, even of the Son, even of the Holy Ghost, which would imply in that instance that there's one name that applies to all three. And there is. Amen. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? See, it's not hard to understand. So there are some little things, and I guarantee you, the New Testament Jews would not have read into uh, the original Greek writings of the apostles. They would not have been reading it with a Trinitarian bias, trust me. They would have been reading it with a clear understanding of, of what the writer was saying, all right? That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. Amen. I want to tell you, there is, there is something to be said about the power of unity in the church. Now, I'm going to tell you, you will never have worldwide unity in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ as long as we're earthbound, okay? Mm -hmm. The Word of God said, until we all come into the unity of the Spirit, all right? That day will come. But as long as human beings, you've got some that approach the Word of God with spiritual eyes, you have others that approach the Word of God with carnal eyes, the Word of God telling us carnal mind is enmity against God. It cannot understand the things of God. It's not possible that it can understand the things of God. There are all kinds of denominations and organizations out there today that are built upon uh, carnal understandings. You know, I think sometimes those of us in the apostolic world we, we and, and myself included, we get so hell-bent on the oneness of God that we don't give a little bit of latitude in trying to understand where the whole Trinity doctrine came from. Mm -hmm. The Trinity doctrine, what it was in a nutshell, is it was a carnal answer to a spiritual question. Right. It was men looking at the Word of God looking at the message of the gospel through carnal eyes and trying to explain then how Jesus could be both God and man. But their answer was not a spiritual answer. It was not an answer based on revelation. It was an answer uh, based on learning. It was an answer based on, really, if you go back, it was an answer based on Greek... Um, yeah, if I can think of the word I want to use there. Not mythology. No, no, no. Philosophy. Philosophy. There's, there's a great deal of Greek philosophical 
uh, influence in Trinitarian doctrine, okay? And you wind up walking this big circle and talking in a big circle. But, you know, the sad thing, and I wish, I wish, you know, coming from a Trinitarian background, I think I have probably a better understanding of this than a lot of oneness preachers do. But I wish sometimes oneness preachers would understand. Within the Trinity, there is the seed of the oneness. There really is. The seed of the oneness is in Trinity doctrine. I know many, many, many people who identify as Trinitarian who believe in the oneness of God. They don't even realize it. Because if you say to them, is God three people? They say, no. No, God's not three people. How could God be three people and be one God? No, there are three manifestations of God. Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. It's body, soul, and spirit. It's, you know, gas, liquid, solid, water, ice, and steam. You know, it's three manifestations of one substance. It's not a matter of three different, you know, bodies, three different entities of any kind. God is a spirit. Mm -hmm. God is a spirit. Anytime you read the word God, you're reading spirit. Anytime you read the word Father, you're reading Spirit. Mm -hmm. yep. This isn't hard to understand. People say, well, how could Jesus pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? Father, if it be not, if it, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Who is he praying to then if he was the Father? I say, well, are you supposed to be a Holy Ghost filled Christian? Yes, I received the Holy Ghost if you're Baptist. Oh, I received the Holy Ghost when I prayed through and when I became a Christian. Okay, so the Spirit of God will send you. Yes, He does. Why do you pray aloud? <laughs> if the Spirit of God is in you, why do you voice your prayers? Why do you speak them aloud? If God's within you, all you should have to do is think the thought. And God's there. He's inside you. He can read your mind. Why does the Word of God teach us to pray at all? If the Spirit of God is within us. So all the Lord was doing for our benefit was voicing, putting a voice to the struggle that He was having between submitting to the will of the Spirit which we call God, which we call the Father, and the flesh, which is what we call the Son. It was the struggle between His humanity and the divine purpose in His coming, okay? So people, you know, they ask these questions and they, they don't understand these. To me, it's rather simple, of course. I've been in this a long time now. I've been preaching this a long time. So I've kind of put some two and twos together over the years. But amen. But I'm going to tell you, there is power in unity. Mm -hmm. the, the most powerful thing any pastor can do mm -hmm. is to do everything in his power to maintain unity mm -hmm. within his local congregation. There's a church, I'm not going to name the name, but we fellowship it on occasion, and I love the pastor, and the people are sweet and everything, but I'm telling you, and I've said this before, and I've told you, there is a disunity, there is a disconnect, and it's going to destroy that church. You watch. If, if that preacher don't get on that and get on it fast, it is going to, it's, all, it's already doing it. I mean, honestly... We know people that go there and have quit going there, you know, because it's just too chaotic. It's too crazy. You cannot function with disunity. Satan knows this. The first thing the enemy will want to do is bring disunity to the local fellowship. This is why we must operate in consolation and patience one with another. Amen. Amen. If we let our differences 
become roadblocks every time we differ with somebody on some little jot or tittle or some little point or some little understanding. If we keep letting every one of these little things get in the way and disconnect us from one another, eventually you don't have a church with 200 people. You've got 200 people coming into one building. That's right. Amen. They're no longer connected. They're, they're, you don't have that. I'm going to tell you, one of the things about Riverside Church of God that Brother Gillum had going for him was the fact that, boy, I'm going to tell you, when them folks come to church, they were all there for the same reason. Uh -huh. They were all there looking for the same thing. Mm -hmm. I can tell you right now, this church... This church, I'm not talking about, you know, anybody else's. I'm talking about this one that the Lord's put me over. Does not have the unity of the spirit that we ought to have. That's right. Because as the guy that handles the rudder, mm -hmm. I've tried to steer us in certain directions, and I said it Sunday, and I'll say it again. And there are people that by God just aren't going to go that way no matter how much I talk about it, no matter how much I hound on it, no matter how much I preach about it, no matter how much I pout. They are going to do it their own way. Bless God, that's all there is to it. Oh. And I've got news for you. The direction I'm trying to steer it in is the right direction. Trust me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trust me. When this church gets to the point Woo, glory. When this church yes. gets to the point where every person that comes through the door mm -hmm. immediately finds a place of prayer. Oh, yes. hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Before church, whether they're here 40 minutes early or 4 minutes early, mm -hmm. whether they're here right on time, hadn't you ever seen Folk come from a black church background. When they come into the church house, they can be 40 minutes late. They still bow down at the pew and say a prayer for a minute or two before they get up and sit down in that seat. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I said in my first church, I, I was a 19-year-old kid, and I told our people, I said, I'm going to tell you how Pentecost works. I'm going to tell you how the Pentecostal church works. So we pray. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something. There were some people here Sunday that needed something from God. Yep. Sunday. Mm -hmm. it's Sunday. Two of them, not just one, two of them. Yep. Okay. And instead of us being in prayer... Instead of us praying the glory down, instead of us praying the fire down, I'm sick as a bloody mule. I'm struggling just to be here to have church. Mm -hmm. I don't need a conversation about what my uncle said when he when I talked to him this week on the phone and what this one and all that. But I don't need all that. I need people praying the power down because, listen, this preacher is struggling to do what God's called him to do. I don't need your conversation. I need your prayer support. That's right. That's right. <coughs> I know what he's talking about. That's right. I've had to cast demons. I'm going to tell you, uh, <laughs> say, why in the world haven't we seen any devils cast out in this church as of late? I'll tell you why. Church ain't ready for it. Not by a million miles. God ain't going to let that happen until we're ready. As a protection for the church. That's right. Mm -hmm. When I was pastor in my first church, I told uh, Tom and Judy. Judy worked at the Christian bookstore owned by uh, Leo and Sue. And she worked there at the bookstore. And this lady came in the bookstore. I was there one day. And this lady came in the bookstore. And she just as crazy as a loon. Looked like, I mean, I can't even describe to you what that poor woman looked like. She looked like a wreck, like a freight train hit her. Her clothes were mismatched. They were dirty. Her hair was dirty. She was, her nails were dirty. Her, I mean, she looked homeless. And you know what we would today, you would think she, she wasn't homeless. She was married, had kids, had a home. This lady wasn't homeless. She was demon possessed. 
she come into that store and she's talking to Judy and she's talking so fast you couldn't understand two words she said. She's saying things so crazy, just talking. I, I can't even describe what the conversation was like. She goes back and grabs a book and starts to look at it. And then she proceeds to lay down on the floor of the bookstore and hold the book up in front of her. And she's reading the book, laying on the floor of the bookstore in the middle of the Christian bookstore. As she's getting ready to leave, she's saying something to us. And I mean, it was unintelligible. You couldn't even hardly tell what the woman was saying. And I gave her a card and I said, we have church over here at the Penny Roll Lodge up here in Seymour. If you'd want to come be with us, we'd love to have you. Okay, maybe. And she walks out the door and poor Judy says, my God, that lady's crazy. I said, no, she's not, honey. I said, she's demon possessed. And Judy says, and you invited her to church. I said, yes, ma'am, I did. I said, because that lady needs deliverance. And God wants to set her free. I said, I'm going to tell you something. We know how to do it. You better believe I did. She needed it. That Saturday night is the night the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to fast your sleep. Now, I'm the kind of person, I'm going to tell you right now, I can do without food faster than I can do without my sleep. Uh -huh. And uh, the Lord said, I want you to fast your sleep. And I've told you the story about that. I'm not going to repeat all that. But I go to church that morning. And our people are doing what I've taught them to do. Before service, they're in prayer. Before service, they're yeah. praying. So I'm exhausted, brother. I'm wore out. I've been up all night praying for my people, driving around the community, going to each and every house, mm -hmm. praying for all of my church members. And here I am, been up all night. I'm exhausted out of my mind. Who walks in the church that Sunday but that demon-possessed woman? Uh -huh. Now, don't you know I needed my church to be holding me up in prayer? Yeah. That's right. If I didn't have them doing what they needed to be doing, I did not have the strength or the ability to do for that lady what I needed. We are a body. Yeah. We function as a body. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. And I said, I'm going to tell you, that lady come in and we started having church and she started doing some of the goofiest things. She pulled a hanky out and put it over her head, put it over her face. Oh She's sitting there, starts humming and moving. And she pulls the hanky off and says, Turn that damn music down! Mm -hmm. That's what she said. In the middle of the worship oh, service. We had first time visitors in the church. We had about probably 40, 50 people that Sunday. Mm -hmm. oh. Finally at one point, she gets up and goes to the restroom. Mm -hmm. And the minute she went in that restroom, I said, okay, well, I stopped the service dead in its tracks. Turned off the music. Uh, well, we didn't have pre-recorded music. I mean, we stopped singing. I said, folks, I'm sorry to do this, especially for our first-time visitors. I said, however, as you can see, we have a lady here that needs help from God. This woman needs deliverance. I said, I am prepared to minister to her. I said, if you're not prayed up, fired up, and ready to go up, I want you to leave as quickly as you can leave the building. Please go home, pray for us, hold us up in prayer. Don't just go home and forget about us. Hold us up in prayer. Right. I said, but anybody that is able to stay and pray with me, I said, I need you to hold me up in prayer while I minister to this woman. Two people stayed and the rest of them left. Two people. <laughs> Two people. <laughs> Poor Leo and uh, June Bartell. June got at the altar over here. Leo got at the altar over here. The lady come out of the bathroom. Where'd everybody go? I said, sweetie, I need to talk to you for a minute. Uh -huh. Sit down in a chair. I said, you may not even understand anything I'm about to say. I said, but I believe that you are under the influence <laughs> of demonic powers. I said, and God wants to... I said, God wants to liberate you and set you free. She proceeded then, brother, to literally stand up and go backwards like this and do a crab walk with her stomach up in the air down the center aisle of the church. At which point I said, Satan, you sit down in this chair and don't you move a muscle until this woman is delivered. She did. 
Didn't move one muscle, didn't raise one hand, didn't do anything. It's like talking to a three-year-old child. I told it I was speaking in the authority. I didn't have to be screaming Jesus' name at it. Right, right. Now that devil knows who I am. Mm -hmm. That devil knows who I belong yeah. to. That devil knows who I represent. Trust. <laughs> yeah. And that body of her sat in that chair, and I began, the Spirit of the Lord began to reveal to me oh, spirits God. that were in her, and I began to call them out by name, and I mean started casting those devils out, and tears are flowing, and her nose is running, and I'm, all kind of stuff is going on. Two and a half hours. Uh -huh. Two and a half hours. I'd have never had the strength mm -hmm. if my church had not been praying before that service. We are a body, folks. You cannot think like, you know, uh, when you come to the house of God, you must come with an understanding that you have a function and a purpose in being here. And you've got to keep that function and purpose in mind. You, you cannot lose sight of that. Church is not, this is just not a little meeting you go to and you yeah, go home. Right, right, That's all right. well and good if you were Jehovah. Honey, we ain't Jehovah. Right. We're Jesus' name, right. one God, apostolic, tongue-talking. Right. Yeah. Jesus' name, yeah. baptized, yeah. Pentecostal, right. apostolic yes. people. Yes. That's what we are. We are. Uh -huh. So we don't play that. We're not just coming to go through the motions of a service. We're here right. to do a work for God. Every service both of those people have contacted me mm -hmm. during the week about coming to church. And I knew both of them were coming in response to our deliverance website. Wasn't hard to tell the fella had some very serious issues. You couldn't see, but that lady did too. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even get to her. Mm. Yep. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. Everybody loves to think Pastor Charles is so mean and so rotten and oh, he's just the cruelest old preacher I ever laid eyes on. When I stood up there and rebuked the church for not being in prayer, there was a reason I was saying that. Because of all the days, that was a day when that was needed. Yeah. And as I was saying every word of it, that lady had the biggest smile on her face. She got it. The devil's got it. Mm -hmm. They knew. Oh, yep, Lord. that's right. Big smile on her face. The whole time I was talking. They knew. And we wound up with a missed opportunity. I'm going to tell you, it irks me. It really irks me. The power of God didn't just fall down in a church service because God has nothing better to do. Let me tell you, the Spirit of God falling down like rain, that is God pouring out soup. And He only pours soup out on the hungry. If you're not hungry for the move of God, if you're not hungry for the power of God, if you're not hungry for the demonstration of the Holy Ghost, if you're not hungry for a visitation from the Lord, then honey, you won't get it. And I'm going to tell you something. This church has not seen... I couldn't even put a percentage point on it. We haven't even begun to see what God can do. That's right. And I can tell you why. Because half the people come to church just come in here. Give them, oh, well, church service. i got to be here for church service. Oh, well, I'll just sit here and do my time. And, blah, blah, blah. and that's the spirit and the attitude you come in with. And I got news for you. Until we come into the unity of the spirit, you're not going to see anything happen. You're not going to see anything happen. We've got to become one-minded. This is what Paul's talking about in our text tonight, all right? Mm -hmm. The church has got to be one-minded. It's not about, an ec I'm not talking ecumenical, bringing all the denominations together. That's not what I'm talking about. No. But if every denomination and every sect and every organization 
if each congregation and every organization and denomination would just become united congregation by congregation by congregation, you would see a revival in this world like you have never seen before. One of the purposes of communion, one of the purposes of communion, it is a spiritual exercise that helps to knit our hearts together. That's why it's called communion. Commune, communion. We share this together. We share this in common. Okay? We believe in the death. We believe in the burial. We believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in the body. We believe in the blood. And as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, as we celebrate communion, what, we're, what that is supposed to be doing and what it does if people approach it with the right mindset and the right attitude, it knits the church together. It brings us together. Foot washing does the same thing. The interesting thing about foot washing is foot washing, oh, I've seen God use that so powerfully. When there have been divisions and when there have been rifts that uh, have occurred between people, and all of a sudden you have a foot washing service. Wow. And... The whole concept of foot washing is something most churches don't even think about celebrating foot washing. No. I mean, they don't even think about it, brother. Never mind, do it. They don't even think about it. A lot of your Pentecostal churches don't even do foot washing anymore. But the concept behind foot washing, it, it brings you to a place of humility. What is something you hear me talk about all the time that you hardly ever hear preached about anymore? Humility. It helps you to once again refocus on the notion of servitude and serving one another, preferring one another before yourself. And I've seen situations in foot washing services where just as you're preparing for it, wow. the Spirit of the Lord is there. And, and the whole purpose of foot washing is humility and unity and servitude and all of a sudden sister so-and-so goes over to sister so-and-so and says I have been upset with you I've been offended by you I've been hurt by you and I've been holding a grudge against you but tonight I want to wash your feet <laughs> oh I'll tell you <laughs> I have seen I have seen the spirit of the Lord fall those two ladies will shout for two hours before they ever get around to washing anybody's feet <laughs> because right then and there God does a miraculous work and you see and he brings things back together so communion and foot washing both serve that purpose of bringing things together I felt horrible because this year for Easter I could not find our stuff for communion. We need to do communion. We're, we're going to be doing that pretty quick. I'm going to try to get that together. <clears throat> we need to have a communion service. But I will tell you folks, Paul said that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. Mm -hmm. Even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One mind and one mouth. Boy, I will tell you. I've told you before, and I'll tell you again. The church I grew up in, there was one thing that used to happen in that church quite a bit when I was uh, a young person, into my teens, my early teens especially. We would, in our worship services, uh, the Spirit of the Lord would be flowing and people would be worshiping. You know, I'm not talking about singing a song. I'm not talking, you know, we weren't singing anything. We were just worshiping. That's something you don't hardly see anymore. Mm -hmm. I showed you a video of a church, a, a group, where those people were worshiping. Mm -hmm. They done sung their song. The song was ended, and these people just broke out and worship. And it went on for about half an hour. Oh. Just worship, just worship, just worship. And it's beautiful. And that's what would happen in our church. I mean, worship would just break out. And the pianist would just play 
I don't even know if she was playing a song or just playing something, you know. Wasn't even a recognizable song. It was just like she was just kind of creating a, a gentle atmosphere. All of a sudden, you'd hear people in the, in the church start speaking, singing in the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden you'd hear somebody over here start singing in the spirit. Somebody over here. And as the voices were raised, more and more people began to sing in the spirit. And it was so harmonious you wouldn't believe. It sounded like a heavenly choir. I'm not kidding. It's, you felt like you were in heaven. You were hearing a multitude of languages being spoken, sung, sung, in perfect harmony. You couldn't do that. It had to be God. If you've ever tried to direct a choir, <laughs> yeah, you see if you can get everybody to sing in perfect harmony, all singing the same words, never mind singing different parts. And I remember as a kid, I'm telling you, every time that would happen, it felt like rapture. It felt like the Lord was about to break through the clouds because it, you, it would just like it got up underneath you and lifted you up, lifted you up, lifted you up. Because it was the most beautiful sounding thing you'd ever hear in your life. People all over the congregation singing under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and there was this incredible, Incredible harmony that was going on. Oh. Mm -hmm. Takes unity. Paul said that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. Mm -hmm. oh, Lord. So I said I showed that video of them that old, that, that, I mean, that's not that old a video either. It's a bunch of Pentecostal folks up in somewhere, Arkansas or something. And I mean, that video is not, but I think it's 95 or something like that. I mean, it's not even 10 years old. But I'm going to tell you, those people know how to worship. Mm -hmm. They know how to worship. I'm telling you, all of a sudden the song is ended, it's over. And you didn't see the preacher up in the pulpit trying to rouse everybody and rattle everybody. Uh-uh. They just got to worship in the Lord. And it was the whole congregation. There probably wasn't but 150, 200 people in the room. It sure sounded like a lot more than that. I'm going to tell you something, folks. When I started my very first church, we didn't have but about 13 or 15 people in our services for the first four or five months. But I'm going to tell you, every single time we prayed, you'd have thought there were 50 or 100. We pray in this church, you don't have any trouble hearing me lead the prayer. We don't have that unity we need. And we can't get there until we start coming to the house of God with the right mind and the right purpose without coming. If you're not coming hungry, for God's sakes, why bother going? Yeah. That's right. I hate to say that because every time I've told people to take a beer, or get off the pot in the past, they chose to get off the pot. But honestly, it drives me insane. I come to the I come to church every Sunday. I'm waiting for a Holy Ghost outbreak one Sunday. I, every Sunday I come waiting to see if that isn't going to be the time it's going to happen. And there is nothing more disappointing than coming to church yeah. with great expectation and going home disappointed. Yeah. There is nothing worse in the world than that. Used to go to Riverside, boy, I'd be so excited waiting to see what God was going to do that Sunday. Couldn't wait to see what the Lord was going to do. And by God, by the time church was out, he done something. Oh, praise the Lord. Couldn't afford to miss. I told you, I'll close with this tonight. 
I told you about when I was pastoring my second church. I was, that was in a little town north of Fort Worth. And uh, Brother Gillum was going to preach for me the weekend that Stacy and I got married. And uh, I'd asked him if he'd preach for me because uh, we were going to try to, you know, do something in the way of going out of town or something. We didn't want to do anything, but anyhow. <clears throat> and uh, so Brother Gillum had retired from Riverside. He wasn't pastoring anymore. And poor, I'm going to tell you, that man knew, he knew where God had placed him. He knew. They tried to offer him a state overseership, and he didn't want it. He said, God didn't call me to be a state overseer. Most men would have jumped at it. Most men, oh, prestige. Oh, I'm going to be somebody. They'd have just jumped on it. Any elevation they think is from the Lord. Listen, any elevation is not from the Lord if God ain't in it. That's right. If That's God's right. called you to be a pastor, Tingus, don't be looking to be an apostle. Don't be looking to be a prophet. Don't be looking That's to right. be... If God has called you to be a pastor, then be the best pastor God could ever have. Yeah. Uh -huh. But this notion of looking for elevations, I won't even get into that mess. But Brother Gillum had the opportunity. And it, once he had, once they had made him a state overseer, he could have served two terms in every state in the Union. Mm -hmm. And he could have wound up being a state overseer in 50 states, you know. And for the next 100 years, he could have been an overseer. But he told the Church of God, no. God called me to start Riverside Church of God. This is my, this is my calling. This is where I belong. Well, when he resigned from Riverside, brother, I'll tell you, it was like all the wind was let out of his sails. I never saw a man just so deflated. It was almost as if his whole life purpose was gone. Just gone. He had no more purpose. And I invited him to come preach. I was so excited about Brother Cole coming to preach for us. And that Sunday morning, we got married on the Saturday, and that Sunday morning, he did the ceremony. Sunday morning came, I said to Stacy, I said, we better go to the church. I said, just, we need to make sure everything goes the way it ought to go. You know, I said, I don't, I don't want to leave things and not know that everything's going to be taken care of. We had about, probably about 20 or 30 people at that point, and I said, yeah, I need to make sure everything's going to be what. So we went, and Brother Gillum went there. And folks come for church, and I wound up having to conduct the service and preach myself. Brother Gillum went there. And I thought, well, I wonder what happened. Why did Brother Gillum poop out on us? So, well, now i got to be here tonight, because if he didn't come this morning, he might not come tonight. So turned around, and I went Sunday evening, went back for church, and he insisted to go. We're in the parking lot. And he said, Chuck, we came this morning, but nobody was here. Well, what had happened was, because of the wedding, we canceled Sunday school. But we didn't cancel church. Well, he came in time for Sunday school. And when nobody showed up, he thought it meant there was no church. He said, I thought maybe you just canceled the whole morning service. He said, but we came back tonight in case you were going to have the evening, you know. So anyway, so... This is my, my chief mentor. Yeah. This was a man that I looked up to more than anybody on this planet. And as I was going to that service that night, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to heal somebody tonight, <laughs> and I'm going to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost. I went to church so excited, brother. I'll tell you, Richard, I was so excited. I couldn't wait. I said, God spoke to my spirit. He's going to heal somebody, and he's going to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost. Oh, I was so excited. And we got there, and Brother Gillum got up and preached, and I never saw Brother Gillum labor to preach a message like he did that night. It was horrible. I'm glad he's gone on to his reward because I wouldn't want him to hear this. It was terrible. It was terrible. I never heard Brother Gillum preach like that in my life. That poor man, I tell you, it was like his whole, all the wind had just been taken out of his sails. 
Riverside was his calling, period. That's it, period. End of the story. God called him to establish that church. He pastored it for 35 years. He held on to the old time Pentecostal Holy Ghost holiness way for 35 years when churches all over the country were going cult modern and losing the power of God and losing the move of God like Riverside had. And Riverside was world famous for the power of God and the move of God that it had. People all over the world had heard of Riverside. I'm going to tell you, he got up there, boy, and he just was so labored and preaching, and it was awful. It was awful. By the time he got done, I come up to the pulpit, and I mean, you could hear a pin drop. Mm -hmm. oh. And I got in that pulpit, and I said, well, I said, I'm going to tell you something. I ain't leaving this building. Till God has done what God said he's going to do. I said, and the Lord told me that before we left this building tonight, somebody was going to be healed and somebody was going to receive the Holy Ghost. That's all I said. And the power of God fell on that church. We had a little cement block building that wasn't a whole lot bigger. Really, it was about the size of this area right here. That's all it was. Little six-foot pews that could hold two or three people if you really crammed yourselves in there. You had a row of six-foot pews and a row of six-foot big old wide center aisle, a wide side aisle because really the pews were a little too short for the building we were in. We could have easily at least had eight-foot pews, but these were donated to us by an apostolic church. Donated these pews to us. And I'm going to tell you, the Spirit of the Lord fell. Well, as the Spirit of the Lord's moving, uh, I said something. I said, uh, you know, uh, God said he was going to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost. Well, a young lady who went to Riverside Church of God, and she'd been going there for some months, and Stacy and I used to see her over there. Her name was Crystal. And we used to see her over there at Riverside, and she'd go up seeking the Holy Ghost. And I told Stacy one day, I said, she's not going to get the Holy Ghost here. Stacy said, what are you talking about? I said, God spoke to me and said, she's going to get it in our church. Mm -hmm. That's what the Lord told me. He said, she's going to get the Holy Ghost in your church. We hadn't even started my church yet. The Lord said, she's going to get it in your church. She came that night to hear Brother Gillum preach because since he had retired, she had never heard him preach. So she came to our church to hear him preach. She come up to the front and she said, I want the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the okie dokie, in the name of Jesus. Lay my hands on her. That's all it took. She started shouting and running the aisles. And this little girl was built like a watermelon. She started serious, talking in tongues, shouting, running the aisles, just shouting, talking in tongues. I mean, you could hear her outside the building. She just. I mean, the church is rejoicing. People are getting happy. We're having church. All of a sudden, the phone rings. Jane, my mother-in-law, goes back, answers the phone, comes back in and says, Pastor, as you know, my mother has terminal cancer. They just carried her to the hospital, and the doctors say tonight's the night. She'll be going home to see the Lord tonight. And Brother Love, a great big old heavy set uh, Free Pentecostal, they call them. It means they don't believe in denominations of any kind. Mm -hmm. He and his wife had been free Pentecostals for many, 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 many years. He told me, he said, this is the first time we've ever thought about joining an organization. He said, but we love your church and we love the church of God and we're, we're wanting to join the church of God. Anyway, he said to me that night, he said, brother, the oh Lord laid something on my heart. I said, what is it? He said, if, do you have a hanky? If you don't have a hanky, just pull the shirt tail out of your pants and cut a piece off, he said, and you anoint it with oil, and, and you and that little girl that just got the Holy Ghost said, you two pray over it. He said, and send that to the hospital with Jane and let them pin it to her mother's nightgown or whatever she's got on in the hospital said, I believe God's going to give her a miracle. I said, okie dokie. So we, I didn't have a handkerchief. I never had been one to carry hankies. 
So I just pulled my shirt tail out of my... They brought me a pair of scissors. Brother Richard, I cut a, uh, you know, maybe a five-inch swath off of the bottom of my shirt tail. I'm going to tell you, the cost of a shirt ain't nothing compared to a miracle. That's right. And we anointed it with oil, and I held it in my hand, and little Crystal grabbed hold of my hand. She just got the Holy Ghost within the last 30, 40 minutes. She grabbed hold of my hand, and I'm telling you immediately, she just started dancing and shouting, and I'm trying to hold on to her hand, and she just shouting. This girl went, good Baptist girl. We prayed over that. We sent it. Jane and Stacy ran to the hospital. They pinned it to her mother's nightgown. That was on Sunday. Her mother came home from the hospital later that week. She lived a good while after that. I don't know how, how long, but a very good while after that. The doctor said we... We did not expect it. We fully expected her to expire before the night was out. God healed somebody. And God filled somebody with the Holy Ghost before that night was over. And Brother Gillum, you know, bless his heart. I, it wasn't because Brother Gillum did anything special or it wasn't because Brother Gillum was in the house. But at the same time, God used those circumstances to put all the chess pieces in place. Uh-huh. Because Crystal, bless her heart, she was going to Riverside. You know, she wouldn't have been at our church if it hadn't been for Brother Gillum being there to preach. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, when you get a church full of people that come to the house of God looking for the move of God, right. hungry for the move of God, right. God's going to move. Mm -hmm. God is going to move. And I'm going to tell you, I'm sick and tired of a church full of Baptists. We are not a Baptist church. What Paul said here is so true. Now the God of patience and consolation. Thank you Jesus for being patient. Thank you Lord for being consoling. What is, what is consolation? What does that word, uh, what is a, a synonym for that word? Comfort. The comforter. The Holy Ghost, the presence of the Lord, is our comforter. The God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, patient with one another, comforting one another, consoling one another. According, I insert the words, to the example set by Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind... And one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, folks, I'm going to tell you. When you get this thing right, you won't ever, so long as you live, want anything but. You won't ever want anything but. If there's anything, I thought about it this week. I said, you know, Lord, if there's... If there's anything the Holy Ghost does, I know it don't make you perfect. Because I've got the Holy Ghost and I don't question that. But dear Jesus, I'm so far from perfect. I know it don't make you perfect. But I'll tell you one thing it makes you. It makes you hold on to this thing and you will never let it go. Yeah. If you get the real Holy Ghost baptism, yeah. you're going to know you got the truth, the real truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. That's right. And the truth is not in an organization. The truth is not in a denomination. No. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You're going to know you got the whole enchilada, baby. Oh, yeah. And there ain't a devil in hell that can pull oh, it out of your hands. Right. Once you get there, and that's why the enemy tries to keep people from getting the Holy Ghost. Because, right. honey, once you get the Holy Ghost, there ain't nobody, <laughs> nowhere, no way in the world. You'll go to your grave before you'll deny this message. Right. Right. And the enemy knows it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? Pray.